right, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, this is the first of the Digital HPS series of seminars for the year. Um, I am co-organizing this with, uh, with Stein, who unfortunately can't be here today. Uh, he's, he's, he's off traveling. Um, but the goal is to have a quite broad uh, quite broad approach to digital use of digital methods in uh, in philosophy or in or in uh, history of science. Um, we're going to get quite broad. Um, Stefan's actually not that far away from, from what a lot of us do. This is one of the less broad. We're starting we're starting less broad. Um, but we even got we've got some some commitments, for instance, from uh, uh, a proper digital historian of, of philosophy as well as uh, some people from the Scientometrics community. So that should be pretty cool. Uh, looking forward to it. Um, so yeah, first talk of the series. Um, my Stefan, I've known each other for a while now. We keep running into each other at meetings. Yeah, for like years. Uh, but he is uh, the Digital Humanities Coordinator at uh, Dusseldorf uh, in the Philosophy Department. Uh, he's been doing cool, interesting DHE projects for, for a long time now. Uh, and yeah, excited that I finally had a, a good excuse to, uh, to invite him to come out to live out of love. And, uh, and share with us some stuff that is, that is from his, uh, uh, what, now really very much any moment now finishing PhD project. Yeah, knock on wood, yeah. Uh, <laughs> on on the uh, history of uh, a cool subcurrent in psychology in Germany. So yeah, take it away. Thank you so much for the introduction, Charles, and thank you for the invitation, and thanks for everyone for coming. It's so nice to see so many people here, and hello to everyone at home. Yeah, uh, I didn't know before that I will be the first one giving a presentation in this series, and now I'm starting off with this very niche subject of uh, folk of psychology. Uh, but my talk has the title, The Practice of a Psychology of Peoples, a Corpus-Based Analysis of the Scientific Journal, Zeitschrift für Völkerpsychologie und Sprachwissenschaft. I'll translate that and I'll, I'll touch on how you could understand Völkerpsychologie and what that is. The general agenda is, let's just look at what this Völkerpsychologie is at the beginning, um, then look at prior research and kind of my critique of prior research on the practice of Völkerpsychologie or the lack thereof, if there is any research on the practice of folk psychology. And then what I want to suggest is to use digital methods to catch a glimpse of what this practice might be. And what's a little bit hidden in this title, the practice of folk psychology, we'll also take a look at the practitioners, so the people doing folk psychology in the 19th century. And then I want to draw a quick conclusion. And as, as Charles has said, I'll, I'll have an hour, I hope, I don't overstay my welcome. I don't talk too much. Uh, maybe just, oh well, I've got a little watch there. And we shall see. So let's start out with what is Völker Psychologie. Uh, let's start out with the founders of Völker Psychologie. You can see them both on the slide. There are uh, Heimann or Chaim Steintal and Moses or Moritz Lazarus. Let's start out with Lazarus. Uh, he lived from 1824 to 1903. He was a philosopher and a psychologist, so kind of the borders are a bit fluent at that time. Um, his first public publication on work of psychology, we'll get to that, don't worry, was published in a popular journal, uh, so, so like a general audience journal that's called the uh, German Museum, if you will, the Deutsches Museum. And he published that in 1851. And interestingly enough, he had the first professorship for psychology period, like the first in the world, in 1860 in Bern, um, which is kind of interesting because uh, Switzerland had some, some ways of kind of getting innovative people to join their universities because they were still very small, and they uh, kind of attracted him to Bern, Switzerland, from Berlin. But uh, he later returned to Berlin in 1866 without any job prospects, because as a German Jew, he couldn't get tenure in uh, late Prussia and the early German Empire. Actually, it wouldn't have, like, the law would not have prohibited that, but the academic establishment kind of prohibited that Jews could get tenure, could get professorships. So both him and Steintal were on the fringes of professional academia because they always struggled to, to get an employment. Um, Lazarus is kind of an exponent of an what's called an assimilated German Jewry. 
Um, so kind of assimilated into German culture and really ascribing and subscribing to German culture. And um, interestingly enough, working on German nationalism. So his life project, he would imagine his life project to be like the German nation, working and contributing to the German nation and real nationalist meaning, which of course is really problematic the way that his work might have been misused and was misused uh, later in the 20th century. But his main question was, how can German Jews contribute to the project of the German nation? That's kind of his main question. Chaim Steintal was a linguist and uh, philosopher, and he's actually kind of an important figure in the history of linguistics. If you look at the neo-grammarians, the neo-grammarian movement that happened in the later 19th century, um, he was very important influence on that, although he would disagree with lots of what they did, but kind of important figure in the history of linguistics. All he could achieve was becoming what's called an außerordentlicher professor. It's kind of an honorary professorship, so no, no funding at all. It's just you can call yourself professor in 1863, and he kind of had to, to get by with um, basically selling tickets to his lectures. That's kind of how they, they earned the living for some time. Starting in 1872, he also teaches at the Higher Institute for Jewish Studies that was founded in Berlin. So this was a very new thing that we that there was a university for Jewish studies, and he also taught there. And these are the, the important figures as the editors we'll be looking at for a journal. <laughs> it's kind of we're building up to that. But these are kind of the founders of this concept of Völkerpsychologie. And I promise, let's define that now. Um, Völkerpsychologie, if you would translate that literally, it's uh, psychology of peoples. Psychology du peuple, in that meaning. So uh, it's also translated as folk psychology, but I don't really like that term because folk has this folksy connotation as in folk music nowadays. But then again, that would be in their scope of things. So they're interested in, in culture in any shape or form. It is supposed to be an empirical science of what is called in German Volksgeist or Objektiver Geist. That's the mind or the mind of a people. It's also sometimes translated as a mind of a nation. Uh, the term Objektiver Geist is um, borrowed from Hegel, and in most Hegel translations, it's, it's translated as objective spirit. But for Völkerpsychologie, spirit is overly metaphysical. Because what they're interested in is real culture. And I think culture is kind of the best translation for folks, guys, because what they want to do is like study culture in any way, way, shape, or form. So they're interested in literature. They're interested in how does a postal system work and how, how does the, the post contribute to culture. But they're also interested in philosophy and psychology, because their main, main argument is that this objective spirit the objective guys, the objective guys, is culture, and what culture does is influence the perception of its people. So um, they're coming from it from a rather neo-Kantian perspective, if you will. So such that they, they claim that your perceptions are preformed or at least heavily influenced on the culture you grow by the culture you grow up in. Such as that they arrive at the notion that you can't begin with the psychology of the individual because the individual in and of itself is an abstraction because the individual does not exist because every person is embedded in culture. And therefore, if you want to begin with psychology, you have to start with culture. That's their kind of main point. And the idea is this non-metaphysical interpretation of, of Hegel's objective spirit. It's based on... on uh, uh, the psychology of Herbart and Beinecke, which are, you might have heard Herbart if you studied pedagogy or something like that, because he kind of is treated as one of the founding fathers of pedagogy, but uh, Beinecke is a bit more obscure, but they really, really look at their work. And if you want to translate it in modern terms, it's supposed to be, Völkerpsychologie, the psychology of people, is supposed to be a universal science of culture, but it's decidedly a field of psychology. So it's, it's decidedly not cultural studies, but a psychology. For the reasons I just stated that, this would be the foundational work for any individual psychology we could begin. And then again, because it's, it has such a broad scope, as in 
the entirety of culture, every field of research can participate in Völker Psychologie, in the psychology of peoples, as long as they have the common goal to, well, understand culture and the laws and, and patterns of culture. So, broad scope and huge ambition. And the envisioned application for the psychology of peoples would be national education, as in education, well, you could even call that nationalist education, right? So um, how can each and every one contribute to the project, project of the German nation for them? And you have to keep in mind that when they started out, the German Empire didn't exist yet. So um, they're right kind of in this period that, that the, they, they're living and working in Prussia, and the kind of the idea of a unified Germany is something that is kind of building up and then uh, it's, it's, it's finalized in the German Empire uh, in the 1870s, right? And so we're dealing with 1851 uh, with their first work, and then um, the, the beginning of, of this third cup psychology, this psychology of peoples proper in 1860, 1865. So psychology of peoples is to consist of two parts, and this might be the case why it's interesting for history of philosophy of science, because it's supposed to consist of Psychological ethnography is what they call that. So a descriptive and empirical part, collecting data on the history and structure of peoples, and is what you might call an ideographic part of the science. So really field, field work, but that might mean, uh, I don't know, watching common people in Germany, how they perform their duties, reading, I don't know, reading uh, literature of Renaissance Italy, but also, also looking at really uh, ethnography and, and uh, what's called the Völkerkunde in Germany. So um, ethnography, empirical anthropology and stuff like that. Supposed to generate data for that. But then the other part is what they call ethnographic <coughs> psychology. The use of this empirical data to postulate laws of culture, if you will. Laws of Volksgeist. So, um, and in this sense, it's even more pronounced a psychology because they want they look at the natural sciences and see the natural sciences start to arrive at, at, at laws of nature, and we want to have laws of culture as well. And this is kind of the synthet synthetic part, the nomothetic part. And Völker psychology, psychology of peoples, is supposed to oscillate between those two parts: collect data, synthesize that, detect laws of culture, if you will. Super ambitious project, and I kind of figured out, okay, we don't get tenure in Germany, we have this super ambitious project, how can we realize that? And their solution is, uh, well, let's found a journal. And at the time, like in the beginning of the 1860s, scientific journals were, of course, a thing, but still, it's not really the main route one might take in professional academia. So, um, the, the most important genre of publication was, of course, the monograph, like writing books books proper, but they decided to go for a journal so that, um, or well, because the project of the psychology of peoples was seen as too big for one and enough for many. So really uh, emphatically saying, okay, we have to get people collaborating on this subject. Um, and that's why they founded this um, journal for psychology of peoples and linguistics. I should have translated that as well. Sprachwissenschaft is linguistics. And uh, envision that Oh, I translated it right here. <laughs> and this, this journal existed from 1860 to 1890, and it was then overtaken by the Society for Ethnography, so in 1890. And if we continue that, um, this journal still exists today, and it has been renamed two years ago, three years ago, four years ago? Ah, I should have looked that up. Um, as the Journal for Culture, Empirical, ah, uh, have to look that up. Look that up. Uh, I think empirical ethnography or uh, empirical cultural studies, something, something like that. So, if if you will, this journal still exists to this day. But we are looking at this time slice of 1860 to 1890. Um, and what they do is they say, okay, it's too much for one, enough for many. We should envision that as a lively psychological parliament. It's just a nice quotation. And what they mean by that is, uh, well, the program of this psychology of peoples is supposed to be provisional 
And what that is, its extent and its merit will be constituted in practice. So it should be a platform of collaboration, a platform of discussion, this journal, for what this Völker Psychologie, the psychology of peoples, is and can be. And we should really try it out. This, this program is provisional. We have some ideas. Let's try them and let's, let's, let's see what, 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 what works. But therefore, to, to really answer what the psychology of peoples is, one has to take the entire journal into account, right? If the program is provisional, we can look at the programmatic writings and say, okay, we can kind of get a definition. But to really understand what they want to achieve or what is possible to achieve, we have to look at the entire journal. And as I said, it, 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 uh, it was published for 30 years. It appeared in uh, 20 volumes and 482 articles. Um, and if you, if you really look at research articles to reviews, it's 244, 20,000 pages, yada, yada, yada. I think this might be like a prime example of a rather small corpus, but then again, it's just too much to read by hand, right? And so the idea is to really take them seriously. We have to take this entire journal into consideration. And it was just kind of the way to go to choose uh, uh, empirical methods, to choose some uh, corpus analysis methods. We'll come back to that. Because prior research, and this is kind of my, my, my beef with, with my problem with prior, prior research on, on this uh, psychology of peoples, because it's like, I think every German introduction to psychology, at least if it's aimed at, at students of psychology, has a chapter, or at least part of the <coughs> chapter on psychology of peoples, because not only like Lazarus and Steintal, they founded that, Wundt also did something with what he called psychology of peoples, later on in his life. Uh, I won't focus on that, but this kind of is the, the tradition they, they view that in. And so you will find that in nearly every introduction, but to, to my mind, if you read that, it's, 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 it's highly problematic because they, try to, uh, they tend to treat that as an historical anecdote. It's a failure in the history of psychology, or something is just not. It's either, either seen as overly metaphysical, so they th think that uh, that psychology, psychology of peoples is supposed to be the science of the soul of a nation, like this this uh, this uh, over uh, this preternatural soul of a nation that's somehow ex existent. And, uh, they they see that as, as problematic and in and of itself unscientific, or they treat it as a like a failure, as a as a dead end in, in a branching off point in the history of psychology, leading away from its actual goal, that is experimental psychology, to them. Or it's seen as a naive proto-sociology, ethnology, identical to cultural studies, you find anything. But the main problem is that they do not look at anything except the programmatic texts. And they kind of, at least to my mind, I won't go into that to, to a large degree, they write a kind of a wick history of experimental psychology, right? Experimental psychology is the psychology, capital T and capital P, as in, this is what history has shown us that psychology was supposed to become like the scientific psychology, and what they did, that this is just like a detour from the, the real goal that we should have, that we could have achieved sooner if they wouldn't have been a bad influence, if you will. That's really over exaggerating that, right? Okay? But this is kind of the, the way you can read the literature and the, the way you encounter that. But still, they're only focusing on the programmatic text. They're not looking at the entire journal. And I think I, I've pointed out why that might be a good idea. Um, Eckhart, in a book called uh, uh, Psychology of Peoples, an attempt at a rediscovery, is one of the few people who at least seems to look at the entirety of the journal. Uh, you might see, uh, you, you might not see that because I'm sitting uh, right in front of that. He arrives at 200 articles, I arrive at 482. I don't know which articles he counts or what papers he counts, how he arrives at that number. And he does not give any criteria at all for his categories. He says, okay, there are 67 uh, articles in what he calls comparative linguistics and history of language. Um, then <coughs> history of religion and mythology. Then um, uh, uh, history of literature, also like like uh, fairy tales, uh, folk, folk poesy, po po poetry, uh, poetry or something like that. And there is actually some some of that in there. Uh, then philosophy and uh, history of philosophy, ethnology and psychological anthropology, uh, history of culture, history of morals, uh, history of science. Interestingly enough, I mean, there is something there. 
so on. Well, that's the important stuff we need to be focused on. And there are only, he says, there are only like three articles on psychology. And if that's not experimental psychology, so it's not psychology proper. And uh, we, we have to be really, we have to be, um, um, well, well, how, how does he put that? Um, we have to doubt whether this is an academic journal at all, is kind of his, his uh, conclusion. And while he's, he's one of the few who looks at this, it's just his conclusion is this journal for uh, psychology of people is not, is no scientific journal and especially no psychological journal. And then again, I, again, I think he doesn't really like, this is a normative perspective with <laughs> uh, experimental individual psychology as a benchmark, and I think this does not really throw any light at all and on the historical development of the psychology of peoples. And I think um, it's methodologi methodologically and argumentatively, my, 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 uh, highly dubious. He doesn't give any criteria for his classifications. He doesn't list what papers, what articles he, he put into what category or anything at all. It's just you get this pseudo empirical table, and then he says, okay, we could clearly see three articles psychology, no, no journal for psychology. Let's just throw it into the trash. And I think that should ring the alarm bells for any like historian of science. And I, I think I understand myself more as a historian of science than a philosopher of science. But then again, okay, this is a good straw man that I can, in my PhD, <laughs> that I can work against. And I can say, okay, there was someone who, who did some empirical work on that. We can do better, I think. And uh, it's easy to do better than that, I guess. It's just between the lines, which, <laughs> which makes sense. So, let's have a look at the practice of, of the psychology of peoples. And I'll try to be a bit faster. Uh, since we're in a seminar that is uh, organized by Charles Pence, I don't think I have to really uh, go through <laughs> the idea of this empiric empirical philosophy of science. The idea is that, okay, uh, empirical philosophy of science, we, it's less likely that we make the mistake of, of, of uh, distorting and stuff like that. And uh, empirical research on science might be a remedy, arriving at the idea of, okay, uh, detecting features that would otherwise evade unaided examination by using digital methods. Okay. <laughs> Don't work. I won't go into that <laughs> so, so much because you probably know that. And it's just um, uh, one small side note on my approach is um, <laughs> what you see here is kind of the idea of a hermeneutical circle. It might be the case that this is this is the case because I, I really grew grew up in like continental German continental philosophy of Diltai, uh, rings a bell. This is kind of the, the stuff I was educated on. Um, and this might still be kind of a debt to that. But uh, my point is, um, uh, from the perspective of methodology, I suggest plugging in these digital analysis methods in our more common approaches to history of science, maybe. Uh, as in, when we start out with close reading, we always start out with, with close reading, otherwise we wouldn't know what to put into what uh, corpus or what to look at at all or anything at, at, at all. And then we do some operationalization as in, okay, how can we transfer that into digital methods or questions? And then there's some visualization and some distant reading. And usually this is where, this is also an over-exaggeration, but usually the, the distant reading part, um, maybe even identification of patterns, this is where lots of digital analysis, studies, papers, projects, tend to stop, as in, we arrived at the analysis and we show you a visualization and you can see these patterns and that patterns and this pattern and we kind of have this bird's eye perspective, there you go. Everything else is further research, future research, anything like that. And kind of my approaches, and this is kind of what I want to show you how that might work, is, um, okay, um, I think it's a good idea to take that information, to take the knowledge we, we gain from that, and to re-enter close reading. And I want to show you how that might, might work uh, in the following. It's just, just a little side note on that. What methods will I use? Well, let's, let's start this methods chapter with kind of an operationalization. I, sh I think it should be obvious that what was folk psychology, what was the psychology of peoples in practice, is kind of the research question. This is really like a, a I don't know, heuristic, descriptive question, no normative. Uh, argument on, on, on that level. It's just, what was that? And we don't know what it was because we don't look at, the, we haven't looked at the corpus at the entire journal so far. 
And the hypothesis based on the programmatic test has to be um, it's a descriptive science but with nomothetic goals, as in uh, laws of culture are something we, we look for. And at least from its outset, it's supposed to be encompassing a wide variety of subject matters. And my operationalization of that is uh, we'll do some topic modeling of uh, the journal for psychology of peoples and linguistics. We'll look at that next. But as I said, this is somewhat hidden in there, but I think you can't really answer what was the practice without looking at the practitioners. So who were the researchers on this psychology of peoples? And um, the hypothesis is looking at the publishers, the editors of the journal, who are both kind of situated on the fringes of German academia, at least, or who really, really didn't really succeed in German academia. So this, this might be the case that the other people might also be in these, and this, I should put this in, in scarecrows, second class scholars, as in people at, at the fringes of academia. And how can we arrive now? Well, we can take a look at the metadata and at authority files for its authors. And we'll take a look at that as well. I hope if I, if I rush some more, we can fit everything in there. Yeah, OK. First, let's take a look at the topic modeling approach I will use, as this is uh, a, um, I don't know if you read the paper by Malater, uh, what is this thing called, his uh, philosophy of science. It's worth a read. They use a different topic modeling method, and this is kind of like one of the prototypes. If you work on the philosophy of science nowadays and do some topic modeling, you refer to Malater. But what we are using is, uh, what I am using, is kind of a more topology based. I won't really go into to the nitty gritty details of that, but the fun thing about this top to deck is that you embed both the, um, the you can see that the important words that occur in a corpus, you embed them into the space, and you embed the text that use these words into a space, and then you can just build clusters, as in the words that are close to certain texts tend to describe these texts best. And I think this is as far as I should go into the, the technical details, because mathematically wise, this is super complicated and it's just the, the case that works well and this the, the, the good thing is that this serves also as kind of a clustering algorithm as well so we both we kind of have distinct topics and each document belongs to one topic and one topic only and we just try to build these clusters um, and practically and please excuse this uh, a little bit silly uh, representation Practically, for, for us as researchers, topic modeling is, and this is always the example or the, the metaphor I give, imagine playing Taboo. I don't know if you know the game Taboo. Um, playing Taboo with your computer. Because the computer goes ahead, like in this case, top to back, as the topic modeling algorithm, and it gives you a number of words, but the thing is you have to imagine that it's omitting the, the, the one term that would describe this, the one term that, that the, the algorithm actually wants you to come up with. And it gives you maybe sentence, word order, example, following syntax, case, verb, and subject. And it would, you, your, would be your um, task as the human researcher to say, okay, syntax, grammar, linguistics, something like that, to really kind of try to find a label for this list of words that this thing gives you. Just as in Taboo, they are not allowed to, to mention the, the term that you're supposed to, to uh, find. And um, this is kind of the idea of, of doing topic modeling in practice, playing taboo with your computer. If you're interested in that, I can show you more of the detailed process. Probably it's best to, to put that uh, to the end, to the discussion, and then we can discuss how we arrive there. But maybe let's, let's uh, keep on rushing through the presentation again. Uh, the data I use. As I said, it's this journal for psychology of peoples. Um, I get that, thankfully I get that from the uh, University Library of Berlin. They've digitized the entire corpus, the entire journal, um, and also put some metadata to that. So we kind of, we can figure out, uh, is, is it a journal article, is it a review? 
and uh, there's the title, and after the slash, there's the name of the authors. We have the pages it starts on. Unfortunately, we I, I, I can download a, a OCR, so a, a text file from, from the University Library in Berlin as well, but this metadata is not, not really, it's not enriched with this metadata. So the only place you will find the metadata is in this HTML of the website, and you can download it as, as a year volume, and this is, they could have provided that, but probably it was too much of a, of a, of a hassle for them. So the, the, the thing I did is uh, kind of scrape this information from the internet, put it into a, a table, uh, to a database, and kind of prepared my data in such a way. And then, as you can see, we, we have the names of authors in this metadata. See here. Um, we can look at authority files. So the German National Library, for people like German authors, I actually don't know what's, what's their criterion, well, if, it's, if it's people writing in German or if it's pe people born in German-speaking countries. Um, but for German authors, the German National Library uh, has what, what's called an authority file. Um, and uh, it contains some really interesting information. Oh, I don't, don't have everything in here. But you can maybe see it has the name of the author, like, the, like an official name of the author, which is useful for disambiguation. Get that shortly, but it, for example, also has um, their occupations. So uh, for Moritz Lazarus, one of the editors, it has uh, philosopher and psychologist. And if we were to scroll further down, and it didn't fit on here, uh, uh, it also has a date of birth and a date of death. So using the date of birth, we can calculate the, the age of writing, for example, and then take a look at the demographics of the journal as well. I put that uh, on the end. If you're interested in that, we can also take a look at that, but I think that won't fit in here right now. But as I said, uh, disambiguation, um, we have two people called Michael Holzmann in this uh, journal. They're both contributing to that journal. And it took me some time to figure out that these were two people because they're both called on the left-hand side, you can see what, what the metadata provides. On the right-hand side, this is the disambiguated metadata. So it's Holzmann with one N and Holzmann with two Ns, if you're lucky. <laughs> if you're lucky, if they are consistent, which they are, sometimes are. And uh, these were two people. Uh, one was a, a librarian in Vienna. The other was a teacher in Berlin. So both people, same name. Uh, both wrote in German. Both wrote, wrote on kind of similar topics. Both are kind of linguistic topics, so it's sometimes really hard to disambiguate them. But it, it, it can be done with the help of these authority files, because with authority files you can kind of give them a unique identifier, as you would be used to do nowadays with uh, ORCID or ORCID. Um, like the uh, German National Library provides what they call a, a GND, so GND, which is kind of an identifying number for a person. So we kind of can communicate, okay, we, we, we're referring to this. Michael Holzmann and not to another Michael Holzmann, which is useful. And we can then, of course, also look up their uh, occupations, date of birth, date of death, and see that it's already in here as well. So, the data preparation looks like that. I download the volumes from the, from the websites of the um, Berlin University Library. I uh, separate these volumes, so there's only one file for an entire year. I chop that up into the uh, corresponding articles, enrich the, that with, with metadata and with authority files, and then I separate the journal articles into chunks of usually 500 words, because um, in, 19, in the 19th century, journal, or journal papers, journal articles tend to be super heterogeneous, as in, um, Georg Simmel republished his first try at a dissertation, republished that in some, uh, ch some chapters of that in this journal. So there might be a single article that encompasses an entire um, issue of the journal. So there might be a single article that is 70, 80, 120 pages long. And there might be other articles that are of the length that we expect the journal article to be, so I don't know, 12 pages, something like that. There might be reviews that only span half a page or maybe two pages. And to kind of get, to somehow put this into relation to each other, to somehow make it comparable, like the data comparable, I decided to chunk these articles into these, these kind of article fragments of 500 words. Um, it is kind of a standard practice in the digital humanities sometimes. Um, I think there is no real objective argument for doing that, otherwise, then it works. And we kind of 
get a higher granularity, as in if, if, in, if an article is 80 or 120 <coughs> pages long, it's probably not only on one singular topic the entire time, but then maybe there are examples from one area of research and then there's a conclusion that reads differently, and this would be then separated into two different topics, which for my use case is useful, but for other use cases that might be detrimental. So, this is the method, this is the data. Again, the reminder, 482 articles. Um, yeah, I mean, you can see, see down here, there's uh, an article 95,000 <coughs> words long, and uh, the shortest is 35 words long. So, uh, there's a huge, huge differences in, in article length. So, um, we got the boring stuff out of the way now. Let's look at the interesting stuff. We'll now first look at the um, results of, of these data analysis, and then the two case studies will be looks at the data, or not the data, but really like looking at text, like, like at text chunks, and then uh, again at one practitioner of folk psychology, if you will, more closely. So we, I try to show how one can close this hermeneutical circle of digital analysis. But first, let's start out with the data. Um, and because we have this, this metadata, we can just take a look at some, well, basic stuff, the, the top contributors to the journal. And we can see, and this is kind of a usual case for 19th century journals, uh, one of the top contributors is one of the editors. In this case, it's uh, Chaim Steinthal, who writes like the absolute most articles for this journal, and Moritz Lazarus, who's kind of the, the guy everyone associates with, with psychology of peoples, he's number five, I think, yeah, number, yeah, number five. So uh, there are even more people who write more than, than Matzos. Um, and all these people in between, Kurt Bruchmann, Ludwig Tobler, Franz Mistelli, Michael Holzmann, Karl Michaelis, they're fairly unknown. Actually, like, um, if you know, know some uh, German philosophy of the 19th century, you would encounter some some names you would know. Um, Cohen wrote for the Journal of uh, Völkerpsychologie. Wilhelm Dilthey wrote for it. Uh, Kassi, no, not Kassela, I mean, I mean Simmel wrote, uh, wrote for it. So there are some famous people publishing their mostly first articles in this Journal for, for Psychology of Peoples, but the people really contributing, contributing, contributing to it a lot are people who are rather unknown. So Kurt Bruchmann is uh, a professor in Berlin. Um, and a uh, philologist. Ludwig Tobler is a Swiss linguist, a folklorist. Um, Franz Mistelli is a teacher, Lazarus, as we had as kind of this, this first professor and then heads to Berlin without a job. Michael Holzmann is also a teacher and then he taught teachers. Um, Karl Theodor Michaelis is also a teacher. So teachers pop, off, uh, uh, pop up a lot. So not professors, but teachers at high schools, at, at, at grammar schools, stuff like that. So these are the top contributors. Maybe let's take a look at the top reviewers because reviewing is kind of an important function of a journal, right? So reviews is, is kind of the area of uh, the kinds of text where people look outside the, the journal proper and try to get some information from other areas of research, uh, from other researchers who have written for the journal. And uh, we see, again, <coughs> Chaim Steintal is the co top contributor. So. Um, in total, he wrote more than half of the entire journal, I think. It's just like this was his, his baby. But he was also like, uh, like, he wrote a lot, so he wrote a lot of monographs and books. But then again, uh, people like uh, Michaelis and uh, Michael Holzmann, who are really not, not like established professors or people in academia, they're even more important when we look at the reviewers than we look at the, at the articles themselves. And in and of itself, this is just a power law distribution. This is just one kind of distribution we might uh, expect to encounter. So few people contributing a lot, and lots of people contributing to the journal. Let's maybe leave it at that. But um, if we look at the top occupations, as I said, we can take a look at what were their occupations. We see philologists are important, which is kind of linguists, we would call them nowadays maybe more, but they're kind of on the fringes between a literary studies scholar and linguists. Um, and this is um, the Journal for Psychology of Peoples and Linguistics. 
So linguistics has been put in there as well, but for a good, good reason, and we'll come to that when we look at the topic modeling. Um, but then writers, as in professional authors, is the second most important um, uh, occupation. And then we already see teacher, pedagogue is down here, um, headmaster is down here, politicians, people working in publishing, pastors, some people like that, librarians, artists. So take that with a grain of salt because um, the occupations listed don't have any uh, time stamps. So if a person started out as a teacher and later became a professor, he, sh he shows up multiple times in this graph. But still we can see that some of these occupations are well outside of established academia again. And lots of them are in kind of teaching, schools and teaching in a broader sense, which might be interesting. Looking at the topic modeling, um, top to deck resulted in 78 topics, which were first interpreted by hand and then grouped into 33 categories, uh, which were then uh, further grouped into 14 higher level categories. So this was all done by hand. So some reading of the topic keys, some uh, having a look at the text they represent, so on and so forth. Um, and then really like putting that together and getting a good idea of which kind of topics, which kind of categories describe the corpus best. And the results would look like that. We have a topic on arts, one of cultural history, ethics, ethnography, folklore, consisting of two different, so uh, different uh, topics, customs and narratives. So this folklore <coughs> narratives might be fairy tales and myths and stuff like that. Oh, well, myths, not myths, in our mythology, language, mythology, orientalistic, which is its own thing. So uh, German Oriental studies uh, at the time, meaning uh, studies on, on Semitic languages, on African languages, on uh, Asian languages, but also, and this is kind of the thing with orientalistic, combining these language studies also with history and literature. So it's interconnected, uh, so it's, it's cultural studies of everything that was deemed to be the Orient. We also have the German society for the Orient popping up uh, a little bit earlier, but becoming very, very important at the time, so on and so forth. But 8% of, of the, of the uh, articles are on psychology, uh, so this turns out to be the third mo most important category when we do this topic modeling. 7% on religion. Reviewing tends to be its own topic because when we review we kind of tend to use a special kind of vocabulary to refer to people and this just shows up as a, as a topic. The sciences, as I said, history of science also plays a role. And theory tends, to, tends out to be a second, the second most important topic. So reflecting on what Völker Psychologie is and can be is its own topic, which kind of is a good sign if the program is, is kind of just, just uh, a first idea and then we want to work on that, we should reflect on what we're doing and if that works what we're doing. So, um, but looking back to what I said, Eckhart, like this first look at what is psychology of peoples, I do agree that language plays an important part, I absolutely agree, and this is also what, what comes out here. But then, uh, like theory, self-reflection, this is something that didn't even show up in, in Eckhart's uh, analysis that we looked at at first. And psychology, for example, plays a much more important role in this journal than he would have argued. And this is psychology proper, like psychology of the individual, uh, or at least closer to psychology of the individual. And I think the scholars of Völker Psychologie would argue that all of this is psychology if we perform that, if we do that with a psychological goal in mind. As in, if we, if we do uh, linguistics with the idea of we want to understand a law of culture while doing that, then linguistics can contribute to psychology. So this psychology is more like psychology of the individual. And once you do this topic modeling, um, or at least once I do this topic modeling, I'm interested in um, the development of this journal. So we're looking at the practice, we should also look at the de development of this journal. And this does not look pretty. This <laughs> is kind of chaos in and of itself. Um, but we will focus in on uh, some certain topics. Let's just first focus in on language. And language, so linguistics, stays important throughout the journal. Um, and I think, and a good, a good argument we could make 
in the uh, in the vein of these uh, people studying folk psychology is that language can serve as a role model for detecting laws of culture because grammar and like the regularities of grammar, of syntax, and of morphology can really serve as a role model of how a law of culture could look like. And I think this is a good case for why linguistics stays so important for the psychology of people. But then again, we might notice that there's <coughs> very little linguistics at the very end, and we should look at that as look at that as well. Psychology as a topic has its highs and lows, and um, I, what what looking at it in detail should look like is um, is this just singular authors who are contributing? So what, what my point is there's more psychology in there, but this looks weird. So this is popping up somewhere and then it's not important and popping up again and, and so this is kind of a weird development and we should look at what this development does. Theory starts out strong and becomes less and less important in the uh, in the duration of the journal, and this should should if if you if you look at, at this at the science, this should make you wonder or ring the alarm bells. Um, there is a paper uh, that says that uh, psychology, the psychology of peoples, has a loss of scientific approach, and I think the the data kind of might suggest that this is the case, right? At first, we are reflecting what we're doing, but we kind of lose this idea of we should reflect what we're doing and where we're going. <clears throat> And lastly, uh, in this, um, as I said, as a side note, after this was the Journal for Psychology of Peoples, it became the Journal of the Society for Ethnography. <laughs> and we can see that um, the customs, like folklore customs, becomes important at least uh, in the two, like the 18th and the 19th, the, 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 at the end of the journal, if you will. So we might even argue that kind of a, like, a, 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 the, 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 the um, what would you call that? The, 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 uh, the occupation by, by uh, folklorists, or the, the, the takeover by folklorists happens even be before this journal uh, gets its new name. And I didn't want to focus on that, but now I took some, some really long time to arrive here because I think looking at these case studies is way more interesting maybe and now I have to go through that uh, selectively because I think it's important to look at what psychology is for them what theory might be and what these folklore customs might be so what we'll do in the following is look really shortly because I have like eight minutes time um, um, what what how does how what does a prototypical text chunk on psychology look like to give you an idea what might be psychology for them? And I, <laughs> this is way too much text. Um, but this is kind of a, a chunk in which uh, Steintal, again, one of the editors, uh, thinks about how we might read Demosthenes and Cicero as compared to people reading them at their own time. And he arrives at the conclusion, I do not say that Demosthenes is bigger to us than he was, but he has a different effect on us than his listeners. So this is kind of what, he, what he's working on here is kind of a psychology of reading, a psychology of reception. And then again, he arrives at the, at the end as this, like, uh, our culture is different, therefore we read Demosthenes in a different way. This is kind of in the vein of his argumentation. And um, if we look at the aims of the journal, this is kind of a rule he's trying to, to apply here, right? So he kind of tries to arrive at something that is, this is, well, more strict than a law of culture, but he kind of tries to arrive at something that might be rule-shaped, so it's in the direction of something nomothetic. And while he's also looking at uh, ideographic, at, 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 at singular ideals. Dilthey, so if you, if you know German philosophy of the 19th century, you might have heard of him. The German aesthetics developed on the one hand under the influence of Kant's analysis, on the other hand due to the power of Goethe's conceptions. And his lively knowledge of the processes of fantasy seemed to be the key to understanding the highest poetic work in general. So um, the effects of culture on the mind of people. Goethe, who is like an author, a literary author, affecting the aesthetics, aesthetics, and in this case it's not only aesthetics in the meaning of perception of art, but aesthetics as uh, 
well, the, the empiricism, well, the, the ideas, uh, the, the, the theory of perception, aesthetics, so, so kind of like a theory, uh, theory of perception, uh, again, arriving at something that might be rule shaped is at least the idea here. I will, I will jump, I will skip that, but uh, Zimmer does something that, that looks way more like a uh, psychology of the individual, really saying, okay, the following hypothesis sh shall be dead. When we are excited, we feel our heartbeat and pulse more clearly due to the faster circulation of blood, and these, because they are very rhythmical, leads to rhythmical movements. So, um, physiological uh, phenomena having uh, consequences for a psychological states, so this is kind of a more physiological informed uh, psychology, if you will. Uh, let's skip the, that. Just, just believe me that the theory stuff is good as well and that they try to, <laughs> to get arrive at, at some kind of, uh, 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 kind of patterns and kind of laws. But then if we look at these folklore customs, the rinsing of the mouth has to occur three times, and in the case of the Shudra and the woman only once, namely with as much water as the hollow hand may contain. Norwegian superstition forbids to pick up a knife or a spoon, which was dropped on Christmas Day before the next morning. In Rome, it was a bad premonition to take away a guest's table when he was sneezing or drinking. So, collecting data. This is really just ideographic. So, this folklore. Uh, aspects of the journal. I really like collecting data, collecting data, collecting data without really arriving at anything which they might deem to be a law of culture, but really like looking at, okay, how does that work in certain cultures? And this is on, on dances and stuff like that. So, um, if we would have had the time to look at that in detail, I'm so sorry <coughs> that, that I uh, got so wordy, we might have seen that, okay, it contains, these topics contain both this ideographic side, as in collecting data, and also this nomothetic side, at least arriving at something that looks a bit like a law of culture. But these, these excerpts then again were, of course, detected because we had, well, I had a look at the data and I could, could really look at, okay, which excerpts are most representative, most important for which topic. And uh, really shortly, because I don't have a lot of time, I want to show that the looking at the metadata and at the authority files might also enable us to find people we might not have looked at if we didn't do this data analysis. Because this Michael Holzmann, one of them, the Berlin Michael Holzmann in this case, is the fourth most important reviewer and the sixth most, most important author, I think. And this is someone, there was not, not an article on him I could find anywhere at the beginning. Um, there was one extant, uh, that, that someone wrote, like a, a student of his, Julian Hirsch, wrote a biography of him, but it probably was destroyed during the Second World War because there was one extant copy of that and that survived in the National Library of Israel. And uh, I, I found that in their catalog and they sent me a, a, a scan of that and this was kind of <laughs> the uh, Eureka moment for me in this case. So this is kind of someone who's important, of, of, of certain importance for this journal, he's an important practitioner of this journal, and we know nearly nothing about him. And we might take a look, so, so we look at him because he's important for the journal, we don't know anything about him, so this might be a person we should take a closer look at. And we can take a look at his kind of thumbprint, or his, his, his thumbprint in this journal, and we can see, okay, he's a linguist. Like, he's a die-hard linguist, he mostly only writes on, on language. And, um, yeah, contributes in that way to the Journal for Psychology of Peoples. I won't go into detail here, but what you can see is uh, he became what's called a, an ordentlicher Lehrer, a regular teacher uh, at the Zephim Realgymnasium in Berlin, so at a high school, a grammar school, and uh, a Berlin newspaper of the time says, this is the first time that a Jew will teach at a local higher municipal school in 1874. So uh, anti-Semitism in 19th century Germany for you. So, um, but then again, he was a teacher, but he was really, really uh, successful at what he did. Because at this time, he was uh, a teacher for, um, for girls. And later, he became um, the royally appointed president of a teacher's seminary. So a teacher teaching teachers, if you will. Um, and this, this title is something new that was awarded to him and to the seminary. So. Um, a teacher, but a successful one at that, contributing to 
the Journal for Psychology of Peoples. Um, and his biography has some really like, this is a hagiography, so this, this, this Julian Hirsch, who wrote the biography, was a big fan of Michael Holzmann. He said, and this is kind of encapsulating in him, he wanted to be a scholar, but he was an educator in the most noble sense of the word. And reading in the last minute, a very, I will only read a, short, a small uh, excerpt. This is the speech that Holzmann gave at the inauguration of the new building for the boys' school, which kind of gives you a sense of education in the vein of psychology of peoples. They, namely the new boys at the Jewish school, shall prove to be Germans that carry the cultural elements of our grand poets and thinkers. Now, the cultural elements our grand poets and thinkers have sown as life elements. They shall prove to be understanding and faithful members of the Jewish community, who are conscious of the destiny of Judaism as a means in the world culture. So, we, we talked about that uh, beforehand. So, nationalism not in the vein of Blut und Boden, so, so like, uh, because, because you are German, like, if you are biologically German, you are part of the German nation, but if you partake in German culture, you become German. And this, this turns out to be kind of their definition of, of folk in, uh, in, in the uh, psychology of peoples. You belong to the people you subscribe to. You belong to the people you want to belong to because you have a shared language, a shared history, and you regard yourself as German. And this was just a very short look at what might be kind of Völkerpsychologie in application as an applied folk of psychology, this kind of national education, getting a glimpse of that. So, coming to a very short conclusion, I put way too much on this slide. What was folk of psychology in practice? I think it proves to be a hybrid interdisciplinary science. Um, folklore seems to start way before the, the takeover. Uh, data seems to indicate that this loss of scientific approach might be the case, and this we would have seen that if we could take a more closer look at the uh, text fragments. There seems to be not such a clear-cut distinction between collecting data and then establishing laws of culture, but it's more like this and that and this and that, and we find some patterns in the data in the empirical work. Um, yeah. And there even seems to be evidence of some applied folk of psychology, which is really interesting since so many educators subscribe, subscribe to the uh, psychology of peoples. And then again, um, who were the researchers? Teachers. Like, also people in academia with, with a good studying in academia, but people um, at the fringe of academia, pe people teaching, but then again, this really fits the program. If the aim is national education, I think they would think of themselves as, as successful because they have attracted so many teaching people and educators. So, thank you so much for listening. <laughs>
Okay. Um, are there questions? Um, do you want to field your own? Do you want me to field? I don't care. This I'll, 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 field and run, I'll field and run a queue for you. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Jeff, I'm curious. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, you have a lot of experience in Python. Uh, to know uh, how did you evaluate uh, and validate uh, the performance of your uh, clustering uh, algorithm? Um, do you use uh, quantitative methods uh, of sort uh, or uh, uh, like that? And uh, the second question is, uh, uh, is the 500 words uh, uh, binning the only binning you tried uh, or did you try, I don't know, adaptive binnings or things like that? Good questions. Um, let me start out with the uh, uh, the first one, like the, the, the optimization, if you will. Um, in comparison to these LDA topic models, where you kind of have metrics to discern if this is a good or bad topic model, these topological to topology based topic models want to be self optimized. So uh, it kind of kind of the idea is that it's it's easier to use. And I think in my case, it's more useful to use. Uh, but then again, I don't think that there are great ways to tell if this is a good model other, other than have a look at it. So it's, it's always this kind of sanity tests uh, that you do. And this kind of, kind of worked for me. Um, and this, I think it goes hand in hand with your second question, because this is, of course, a, a huge parameter you could, you could work on and, and try different bins. But then uh, I, I tried different different sizes of chunks or bins, if you will, um, and uh, I, I just arrived. And this I, I, I know this sounds <laughs> I don't know I'm professional, but this is kind of kind of <laughs> the way <laughs> you could arrive at that. It's just like 500 work the best for this case, and you could try to find an argument that this is kind of the size of I don't know kind of the size of an abstract or of a longer abstract, if you will, that kind of encapsulates some, uh, it's long enough to encapsulate a topic or something like that, but I don't think, I can find a stronger argument than it works. Yeah. I know from, from, a, from a statistical and from, from a from like measuring standpoint, this is really mm -hmm. weak, but um, yeah, this is just uh, it, like the way these unsupervised methods mostly turn out in this case. Yeah. Okay, based, uh, I don't know, on some random uh, evaluation of uh, the... Yeah, evaluation by hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah no, really. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, that was really great. Thank you. It was really interesting. And uh, I, I, have, I have a lot of questions, but maybe two. Um, but let's see if I can sort of wrap my head around them. Uh, so the first one is how, because you, you were talking about this, this interpretative circle of sort of going yeah. to the data and that sort of interpreting back, and I really like that you did that, and you went back to sort of trying to interpret the, the nationalist uh, sort of um, element in, in those works. Um, and so my main question, maybe it's methodological, how, do, how does the programmatic, programmatic text of the journal compare to your findings? Yeah. Basically, are, are they delivering what they claimed they were going to deliver or that they did deliver? Um, and then the second one is that I'm, I'm really interested in, in sort of, you talk a lot about how most of them are teachers and sort of uh, educators, librarians, so they have lives outside academia. Yeah. And, and so I guess most of them are reflecting on their practice. Um, and practice here I refer to, to, to one of their job. Yeah. Um, so, um, I don't know if you can tell us a bit more about that. And, and, and well, I thought I have some more questions, but I haven't formulated it <laughs> yet. So, so let me think about that. But if you can tell us a bit more about, you already talked about the, the relationship with nationalism, how to be a Jewish person in a, na in a German national state, yeah. them being in the fringes. Does it relate in any way? How do they relate to the Zionist movement that was starting to become created? Like, because they seem, as far as I know, to be not in that thinking pattern. They wanted to be Jewish people, Jewish yeah. culture within a, a, a German yeah. sort of overarching yeah. culture. So, if they had any relation to that, you know, to Okay. 
Um, so, uh, starting off with the first one. Um, did they deliver what they wanted to deliver, basically? <laughs> yes or no? No, uh, <laughs> that's a bad, bad answer. The thing is, I, I think from the outset, um, their definition of the people as this voluntarist definition, as in you belong to the people you want to belong to, this is something that's super interesting because I think this is kind of what nationalism, like, like uh, the, the study of nationalism uh, kind of arrives at later, as in like, this, is, this is how nationalist nations might work as well, other than this, this uh, uh, biological arguments or something like that. But I think then again, this is a very, for the time, this is a super liberal and super descriptive approach and a super open approach, and that kind of enables German Jews to really belong to the German nation. Um, but then again, they turn around and uh, work with stereotypes all the time, like the grandezza of a Spanish person, and I don't know, you can't trust a French person or something like that. This is what they write in their journal, where they, beforehand they said, yeah, uh, we should really look at every aspect of culture and be open-minded and look at it descriptively. And then again, they, they kind of bring their own stereotypes into the research. And this is something that's worth noting, and that's absolutely necessary in pointing out. So they, they, <laughs> they don't always stick to their own theory, I'd say. At least Latzos and Steintal, they're both, both the editors. Uh, Steintal is really empirically doing work, so, uh, like, like research in linguist, uh, linguistics. Um, and this is mostly true for, for Latzos, who's kind of the one who's also delivering these stereotypes. Um, uh, and as, as the journal, the, the whole journal, this is like, like a, definitive, a definitive answer as to uh, did they do what they wanted to do. I think they did their program more justice than prior research might indicate. So I think you can say, okay, this is what I wanted to say with hybrid interdisciplinary science. I think they really do that. So there's also some work on a statistic of, of morals. So they really try to, to get some economists into the uh, discussion and look at how we can describe, describe uh, culture with statistical means. Um, they, uh, they have this really minute uh, ethnographic work. They uh, have literary studies people looking at how does uh, an Italian drama work, for example. So it's super multidisciplinary, and I think this is kind of what they wanted to achieve at a look at the, having a look at culture as, as a whole. As in discovering laws of culture, that's hard because what, what is a law of culture? Well, the one thing they arrive at, which is super interesting and super important, is what they call um, Verdichtung in German, which kind of would be compression of ideas. It's kind of the, the idea of we're standing on the shoulder of giants. And uh, they say, okay, this is only possible, like progress is only possible because we, tr we tend to compress ideas in the process of, of transmission and therefore we can achieve process and this is what they call compression and this is kind of one of the fundamental laws that they think that history and culture uh, goes through. And I think this is kind of, the, that could be kind of have a strong claim on this, on this um, uh, law, of law of culture. Um, I, I, I think a third question was, was on their connection to Zionism, and the second question was? Well, just if you can tell us a bit more about like what were these people's life like. I mean, you okay. can mention yeah, that yeah. sort of, and, and maybe also politically, yeah. what that meant for them. Like, how, yeah. Yeah. So, so, there were 114 authors, so, so going into detail would be hard. But, um, uh, uh, like, for, for the editors, they had some, they kind of had a weird standing because they were kind of successful, but didn't really, didn't really reach any financial stability, stability or something like that. Especially Steintal stayed, stayed poor his entire life, basically. Mm -hmm. um, he was once uh, asked to be the ambassador to China for France, but he declined to do that because he didn't want to go to China, even though he was, uh, yeah. He, he lived in Paris for a time, like the, like the French government asked him, do you want to be our ambassador? And he said, well, no, I don't want to do that. And he also got the uh, Prix de Volnay, Prix de Volnay, like, like a very, very important prize for his work at the time, but still didn't really arrive anywhere and gain financial stability. That's all, um, in his later years, and this kind of ties into your question about Jewish society, 
it kind of became an important figure for this nationalist Jew, uh, Jewish movement, uh, as in he was the uh, the head of a, of a Jewish zinode, uh, so so kind of a congregation of, of Jewish people in Germany, and um, he. Uh, like his writings later in life are mostly on Jewish ethics, on Jewish religion and Jewish ethics. But like really their, their stance on Zionism, that's, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know enough right now, yeah. But this is something we, uh, I should take a look at. Really focus on that, but it would be, it would be really important. But uh, yeah, I think this is like the, the editors at least. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for a, a really engaging talk. Thank you. Um, to me, this was completely new, but he also mentions it's kind of a, a, a niche topic. So yeah. I was uh, just curious, like, what, what led you to this particular <laughs> topic, or what were the reasons for choosing yeah. to analyze this? Mm. <laughs> Thank you for that question, because that's what I love talking about. No. Um, <laughs> uh, so I, I could answer that biographically, because I studied in Bochum in Germany. And in Bochum, there was the uh, Diltai Forschungsstelle, so the, 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 the Diltai Institute, so the institute that focused on Wilhelm Diltai. Wilhelm Diltai is often credited as the person who uh, developed a non-metaphysical idea of this objective spirit. And he's kind of the reason why we call the humanities Geisteswissenschaften in German. So, so uh, sciences, sciences? It's, it's a German thing. Sciences of the spirit. But the thing is, and this is what my, my supervisor pointed me to, Dilthey wasn't really the, the first person to think of that. Lots of us was, and he really was. So and they know, knew each other, they were friends for a time, and then they kind of had a falling out. And I think there's a letter by Lazarus on which he wrote, um, like he received that letter from Dilthey, and was just a friendly letter, but afterwards uh, Lazarus wrote on it, uh, remembering the most unthankful of persons under the sun or something like that. So they had really had a tough falling out. But the thing is, uh, Dilthey went ahead and wrote his, his, his um, a, a, yeah, uh, I don't know the English translation of that. So his important work on, on the, on the um, uh, psychology, uh, on the, he also worked on psychology, but then later on, on, on this objective spirit, and he doesn't refer to Lazarus at all. He knew him, he knew him personally, they had a falling out, and he kind of, uh, like, like Künke, this is one researcher I, I, I did uh, quote, he said he just plagiarizes him. So, so it's really like this case, a Protestant German academically established thinker can just rip off the work of a Jewish person at the fringes of academia and get away with it. And he's the guy who's now remembered as the founding father of Geisteswissenschaften, of humanities in Germany, and Lazarus isn't. And uh, this really grabbed my attention. I was like, okay, so we have to do some work on that. And I think that you could argue that this is kind of the, the grand thing that is maybe a bit shaky, but this, that this Völkerpsychologie, the psychology of peoples, is Geisteswissenschaften in a trench coat, is kind, kind of the entirety of the humanities in a, in a really modern sense, like as a descriptive study of culture, uh, which like, kind of it took us some years to arrive there then again, but they kind of tried that back then as a unified science, right? That's their idea, like, the, like one of the last, last tries at, okay, let's have a unified science of culture. And in, if you look at the later history of that, that Dimmel, uh, Zimmel working for it, and Dilthey working for it, and Wundt taking notice of it, like, Völkerpsychologie, the psychology of people, is fractured into many sub-disciplines, uh, sociology, psychology, um, history of science, some, some bit, if you will. So, but still, is this kind of like this prism effect? They kind of focus, they kind of unify lots of fields of research and then fracture that then again, but they play, I think, a really important role at the time because this journal was just like, was well, like, like it was read. So this was kind of one important, kind of important journal at the time. And uh, I think it's just kind of a blind spot in the history of science, and this is how I arrived there, basically. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Keep a question. Uh, thank you very much for this talk. Um, maybe it's the way you presented uh, the, the division of your corpus by uh, by topics, but it gave the impression that, and and it's why I'm asking about the theory paper, uh, the, the papers in the category theory, because the way you presented it gives the impression that they had a scientific object, but they are looking to a method <laughs> or many methods. 
and they are looking anywhere data laws yeah. and knowledgeable thing so so it could be an impression of the way you presented it or is it compatible in the theory papers where where they try I suppose to develop their ideas about what is this new science yeah so basically they assume that there is this object of, of um, this is the object of their science, which is then again objective spirit. But what can count as that? So this is kind of like the we can we can say okay, there is this thing, but what is this thing then again? So this is kind of the area where they maybe maybe discuss it uh, also ontologically and stuff like that. Uh, let me look at uh, sorry. So this um, uh, da -da 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 -da. yeah. So so for example, this this. One excerpt here um, on, on theory that is classified as theory is kind of metaphysics and ontology. So kind of the ontology of, of drives, on, on the psychological drives, for example, which is, which is on the fringes of what, what we'd call culture, right? Uh, <laughs> so this is kind of uh, like a foundational work of psychology, more or less. Um, and. Uh, this one uh, is really like on, on the basis from 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 like nerve, nerve neurology, if you will, neurology and consciousness stuff like that. So this is like more hardcore theory. In this case, it might even be called theory of mind, but like really foundational theory for psychology, um, which kind of serves as the basis for all the other stuff as well. Um, there are, of course, like especially programmatic papers at the, at the beginning that really try to, to, to assess, okay, what, what is the objective spirit? What can the objective spirit be? And um, then again, what they say is uh, use whatever methods you want. <laughs> what, uh, use whatever methods you want as long as they work. And then, of course, what are methods that work? So, so it's just like proof, proof and practice. Actually, in their in their first programmatic paper, proof and practice what methods are useful, and these are the methods that work, and we go on. So it's, yeah, it's everything. Subject, everything yeah, goes. It's more subject driven. It's super, and super subjective. Yeah. Then methodology driven. Yeah, yeah. So it's not it's it's object driven, like culture. Whatever you want to count as culture, and it's okay to have someone working on, I don't know. Um, uh, and a very special phenomenon of, of Semitic languages, for example, that's okay. And someone doing kind of the, the, grand, uh, the grand work on uh, Italian uh, uh, dramas is also okay. So as long as it's an element of culture and somehow ties into this, this grand scheme of things. So very loosey-goosey, but, but I think this is kind of why they were successful, because practically, Everyone could publish anything in there. And I, I, I imagine because uh, Zimmel, so Zimmel's first PhD thesis, I don't know if I, if I quote that correctly, but I think his first PhD thesis was not accepted basically, and he, he published it in, in multiple papers in this, in this uh, journal. And uh, so you could basically, basically argue this is kind of the if you wanted to view that in a bad way, kind of the lost and found, or like the, the trash bin for stuff that wasn't accepted elsewhere. I don't think it was, but I mean, it's super flexible in that way, and it could prove successful in that way, because you could, could publish anything as long as it contributed to culture. Okay, <laughs> are there questions? Uh, I have a question about the, the content of uh, yeah. this kind of paper. So, um, namely, the, the papers by Lazarus uh, and uh, Steintal. Yeah. Um, I'm very curious if it emerged from the analysis of this material uh, that uh, Steintal and Lazarus made any considerations or uh, meta reflections uh, on the possible bias they were subject to by being themselves embedded in the very culture or a full psychology, the study of which they were initiating. So whether they were conscious of their own cultural influence exactly. in doing that. <sighs> at least at least in the way in the way they put it they were. But did they really reflect on that? I mean I mean uh, there was this one excerpt I, I showed you to find something else like 
it, it would, would be a lot of work. If you, if you say, okay, we, we read Demosthenes in a different way than he was read, read, read at his own time, I think this speaks to this kind of at least historical consciousness as into, okay, we acknowledge that we are influenced in our own way, which ties into this, this theory of culture as in for, like, like for this one, compression of ideas of, uh, of this, okay, um, we are, like in their, I think in there, uh, it's a bit, it's a bit muddy if they think cultural progress is, they don't think cultural progress is inevitable or something like that. And they actually claim that, that there is no real progress at all, in their theory at least, in their programmatic writings, but then two pages later on they, they use this, uh, this idea of compression of ideas and say, oh well it took us millennia to, to find out, I don't know, uh, Euclid's, uh, Euclid's theorem or the, the Pythagorean theorem, and nowadays pupils in, in, uh, in, in high school learn that and they can figure that out and use that. So then again, they, they kind of put their own biases back in because they still have this kind of idea of progress. So I think in some places, when you look at the program, they do claim that you're influenced by your culture and by your history. And then there are some instances where they seem to be aware of that. And then there are other instances where, they're, where they deliver, I don't know, stereotypes in such a way that it, it kind of reads in a way that they're not really conscious of applying. They don't apply their own theory to themselves all the time. And then you have these kind of ideas of progress where they also don't kind of stay true to their own theory. So it's a mixed bag. So sometimes they kind of seem to be aware of that. And sometimes um, <laughs> it, may, it disappoints me in them, right? So I'm disappointed when I, when I think, okay, if you stay true to your own theory, you wouldn't have turned out to be so, I don't know, chauvinist in this moment and have, could have, could have uh, addressed this problem more objectively than you have at the, at the time, yeah. It's really a mixed bag, yeah. Okay, thanks. So, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I have a question about specifically, uh, so you kind of delineate these, those authors as practitioners of folk psychology and there is this problem of the fact that you can view the journal mm -hmm. and maybe just lost and found. And I was just interested, how big is the number of authors who were writing on, let's say, methodology or theory mm -hmm. of this folk psychology, and uh, whether they were calling themselves or mentioning this word, or some other words, in their own papers. But because I expect that when Zeman was publishing his uh, PhD thesis, he maybe never mentioned the word folk psychology. So in, in this term, I think you said, yeah, um, that's a good question. So um, the people, the people writing on the theory, at least the 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 articles, the, the papers that are supposed to be theory and synthetic, were published by the the editors themselves. So uh, they start out with a invitation to the journal. That's actually what this what the, their first paper is called. And then I don't I think five years later, Lasso's one of the editors. Uh, Publishes paper paper which he calls uh, synthetic thoughts on, on psychology of peoples. So, a first synthesis of what has been done up till now, and then in the very uh, is it the very last? I think I think the very last volume. Steintal does a similar thing and saying, okay, let's let's take a look back and kind of try to, to to synthesize everything and then reflect on the theory as well. And of course, they they use the the the, the term for psychology all the time. Other papers don't in that degree, right? So um, this might be a good question, as in as in. At least I tend to use or I tend to regard it descriptively as in they write under the under the umbrella of this journal, therefore I can classify that as as folk psychology. But do they use this term and say, okay, I, I am doing I am doing folk psychology? I don't know how often the term linguistics appears in the modern paper on linguistics. Uh, it's, uh, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a good question, so uh, 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 I, I don't have the data yet, but this okay. is a good question. Yeah. <laughs> Max? I have a question about um, so what happened uh, a bit later than the whole story. So did they, was it successful for them to professionalize, to find a job, right? Because it, it seems that that was one of the ideas at the beginning, yeah. right? Like, let's make this discipline and let's like, among us that we are in the fringes, let's help each other. Yeah. Did they succeed? And also what happened to the, to the field 
that when when the there was this editorial change in the early 20th century already, I don't know. Uh, 1890, actually, uh, yeah. Like, did, like, what happened to that? Like, why did it end? And how did the editors of the, the ethnographic, was an ethnographic yeah. uh, sort of journal, right? Like, why did they take over that one? And, and, and sort of in what way they, they think of themselves related to false psychology? Yeah, good questions. Uh, so, so uh, Lazarus and Steinhardt themselves, um, <laughs> to, 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 to put it sh short, so um, what, what you can maybe see by, oh, let me, let me look at, look at that, find that, oh, I'm so sorry, that, right, okay, um, the number of contributions, in, as, as I pointed out, like Steintal is the main contributor, and Lazarus uh, contributed fairly little, and uh, he actually contributed only in the first couple of years, Lazarus. Lazarus's last article in this journal is 1868, and it ran until 1890. Okay. So he went on to other things, if you will, right. Lazarus. He was kind of the, the poster child for it, because he was fairly known at the time for popular talks and stuff like that. And he was one of the exponents of, well, one of the most well-known exponents of, of German Jewry at the time. Yeah. Um, so Lazarus just went on to do other stuff, mainly uh, uh, ethics, and, uh, and kind of didn't really focus on, 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 this, on this journal anymore. And uh, Steintal really uh, wrote on that, um, did some works on Humboldt, he was like a, a real hum Humboldtian, if you will, and then did some works on linguistics afterward. But I think in 1890, you see, uh, Steintal only lived to 1899, mm -hmm. see down here, he was already really, like, in his last years, he was already declining. And I think he just couldn't handle it anymore. And he did make, he kind of, like, Lasso was, was, was his po the poster child. His name was on the, on the, on the front as well. But, uh, like, the, most of the work, work was just done by Steintal. He was really, like, the guy doing the work. And um, I think in 1890, he just couldn't, couldn't do that anymore. And he kind of declined and, and worked on other stuff. Lasso as well. Well, uh, Worked, worked on other stuff and, and uh, lived for some time, but he also declined during the, at the end. Um, so, uh, to them, you could argue this was just one, one building block of their career. And I think, I don't know if, if, if they wanted to, to publish this journal in order to then acquire tenure. Mm -hmm. I really don't know. I don't know if they, if they had any hopes in, in this direction. Like they had some odd jobs, like Lazarus was, had kind of a paid position, uh, uh, some, some, some weird configuration as a regular honorary professor. So he was paid, but he didn't really, uh, it wasn't really treated as one of the professors. And he worked at the, um, the War Academy in Berlin and taught uh, soldiers ethics and stuff like that. So they had some really weird stations and uh, it's, 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 yeah always on the fringes and always kind of uh, in precarious situations as well so so their own their own situation was was yeah bad at the time and it just speaks to the anti-semitism because um like there's this um berlin berliner antisemitismus right so the berlin there's a standard english translation for that the berlin um uh, discussion on anti-semitism so uh when, when kind of anti-Semitism became en vogue in Berlin, when, uh, when professors could stand on the, the podium and, and really put forward anti-Semitic uh, theories. And Lazos, at least, was one of kind of the, the people who tried to, to uh, be diplomatic about it. He, well, not, not as in uh, really <laughs> pro-anti-Semitic, of course, it wasn't that, but kind of really talk to people and find a stance for pro pro-Jewish uh, community in Germany at the time. Um, as it comes to the, uh, what happens to the journal and to, the, to, to Völkerpsychologie, uh, I think to Völkerpsychologie uh, the most important part is that, that Wund kind of took this idea. Like Wund, who, who's kind of deemed to be the, the founding father of psychology proper, of experimental psychology nowadays. Um, in his later years, he was <laughs> basically he said, "Okay, I've done this this minute, detailed work on psychological phenomena, and it's really hard to build anything up from that because we only tend to focus on miniature ph phenomena when we do psychological work. What is the grand scheme of things?" And then he wanted he published his 
20 volume, uh, like 20 monographs uh, volume uh, Völkerpsychologie. And so that's, a, that's kind of the last word on, on Völkerpsychologie, if you will. And sometimes psychology of culture nowadays says, okay, we took some ideas from that, but uh, there is a paper called uh, Was Wund a Nazi? So uh, this, uh, you have to look that up. I'm uh, remembering <laughs> its conclusion. But the thing is, again, a German Protestant then making this theory more okay and more more uh, more more uh, arrived in in, 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 uh, in in public culture. But this was also Wund's uh, later work when he was already fairly old, and this. His work of psychology is so wordy and his style is so bad that barely anyone read it. It's actually it's like that, that you, if you if you read histories of psychology and that they always tiptoeing around the fact that they have to say, okay, Wundt, who's actually our founding father, like our god, he wrote something that's so badly written that nobody read that. So, but they're always tiptoeing around the facts, if, if you will. Um, that's that. And why did the the ethnologists? Um, take over that journal because they were already contributing to that and I think like to their mind that uh, gave them some scientific credibility like this is kind of psychology and the, the psychology has some ethnographical aspects and then we can kind of oh, take, 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 this, take this journal and make it our own and uh, well this is just like a subfield or it's just an, I think to them it was just another name for, for field psychology was their, their kind of ethnology but I think if you look at the, at the text, the, the real ethnologists contributed to, to the journal, like this, this is always this descriptive stuff and then really like what you would call, uh, I don't know, um, everyday culture, but in a way that's not aimed at this kind of, of nomothetic approach mm -hmm. anymore. So not really looking for laws of culture anymore. So I, I think it would be kind of, it's, it's a different feel, but to them, it, I think it blended the scientific credibility. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to jump. I'm going to jump. <laughs> Sorry, I had to step back. Because um, you touched on, actually, you touched on what is one of my, like, pet favorite ideas about DH in history, and so I, I, I hope this didn't get discussed while I was gone. Sorry. Um, I'm really interested in the way that this is a nice sort of Whig history antidote. Yeah. Because I think this is really important as one of the things that these tools can be particularly can be particularly helpful for. Um, and I don't know. Probably the problem is that this is an amorphous. I mean, this is a kind of an amorphous question. But I, I, I guess. Um, um, so in your experience, when other historians of science have made reference to, or historians of psychology have made reference to this journal, which you say is already like rare enough, mm -hmm. right? Um, is it, is it, does it really amount to a kind of, if you will, aggressively Whiggish read? Is to say they, they, they come into this journal because they're like, oh yeah, so there's like a couple of Cohen papers here, we should probably read those. Mm -hmm. Or like, oh yeah, there's a couple of, uh, like there's a little bit of Wundt connection here, so we should probably try to use this to explain Wundt. Yeah. Is, it, is it really that kind of like, when it's used, it's sort of mind in that way? Or um, this, I think it's just because I'm interested in, so maybe let me, to take one step back, like I'm interested in sort of how we sort of detect that we're in a Whiggish history situation, how we spot that. So like, this is a cool example. You found a really cool resource that clearly the history, the kind of present historiography is like not giving its fair shake. And so this is awesome. Like, how can we get better at detecting like where where we find those cool resources, right? Um, that can that can help us do that. Because, like I say, this is one of the, I think this is one of my favorite things about yeah. these methods. Um, Thank you for the question. I, yeah, I it's, sorry, it's a tough one. Finding, but, finding the resource. I, I would start out uh, detecting wiki history, maybe. And uh, <laughs> I, I think what what should sound, sound the alarm bells if it's like the history of, of the big the, the big thinkers history, right. like like. There, there are, of course, some really good histories of psychology, but most of the introductions into psychology that are 
that are read by students of psychology were written by practical psychologists and not by historians of psychology. So I think their handiwork is just not the best. And then, okay, they just kind of reiterate this, this hagiography of, of Wund. So there's this one founding father and he's so important that everything else is unimportant or uh, like a dead end in the history. I, I think if you read that uh, as a historian, you would be like, okay, this just can't be the case in this, this way, this, this kind of uh, really, really putting that, uh, like one person on the pedestal in this way. Yeah. And then detecting Detecting interesting, interesting stuff uh, to to work on that. Uh, that's a good question. So, so ideally, there would be huge corpora of of I don't know all the the journals and monographs and everything that could be of interest to us, and we we would have an opportunity to really search them and maybe. Okay, this is like really, really out on a limb here, but maybe, I don't know, your approaches with large language models and re retrieval augmented generation might get us there eventually, like, like really new ways to search huge corpora mm -hmm. might get us there, but I don't know how you would detect these, these outliers, if you will, or this interesting stuff. Um, I mean, practically, practically, look, I don't know, Keep an open mind. <laughs> this is, yeah, this is, I don't know, we arrived at, at, at the armchair philosophy part. Of <laughs> yeah, we should just keep an open mind and look for, for these people that are. But, but, but I think a good idea would, uh, like, low hanging fruit or, or the, 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 the stuff that should be done in the future is look at marginalized groups. Like in this case, like Jewish scholars or um, uh, female scholars that, that tend to appear at the beginning of the 20th century. We just talked about uh, Anna Tumakin uh, during, during lunch. Anna Tumakin was the first female professor for psychology. Funnily enough, also in Bern. So Bern has the claim on, on the very first professor of psychology in the world period as a Jewish man and then the first female professor for psychology, which is interesting. But she's just like deemed not to be important in the scheme of things which I doubt that's the case. So looking at marginalized groups should be something that we as, I don't know, the community in the history of science should have a look out for. And I think in these next couple of years, that could be a good way to go to say, okay, if we kind of get a glimpse of marginalized groups contributing in an interesting way, um, we, we could find some, some, some threat to pull there and some, some, some stuff to, to gain some leeway, but ideally there would be like huge corpora that are searchable and that are approachable and we can do some interesting stuff to that. Um, and there are some projects starting on that, like building, like uh, 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 Stefan Hesbrücken Walter is his name. He's uh, just starting a, a German research foundation project in Münster on building a good corpus, whatever that, uh, but on building a good corpus uh, uh, for the history of philosophy of German language philosophy, not only the history of philosophy in Germany. And that would be a huge deal if we had like a good resource to, 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 to search, to run some analysis on, and then maybe detect some interesting patterns. Just look at stuff we wouldn't expect to be there. And that could also really like, like get us in the right direction. So uh, uh, like maybe, maybe even, uh, let me just show real quick like this, because this pattern detection might really not be like this metaphorically, because we're using topological methods and, and uh, embedding stuff. Oh, no, I'm not showing the right, right slide and the right thing. Now you see that. Now you see that. So because we're doing topological analysis, we can pro project these. Uh, I don't want to go into vector semantics, but basically we can project this, these texts into a space and the closer two points are, the more similar the texts are. And outliers in this graph tend to be outliers thematically. And um, funnily enough, um, there's a, a very descriptive uh, folklore paper up there that's an outlier. And um, this is also a folklore outlier. And then uh, the Entdeckung des Beharrungsgesetzes. So, um, History of science. There's, there are some papers on history of science that live down here. I think here? No, this is, this is the Platonism of Michelangelo. But this is kind of the... <laughs> yeah, it's weird. Uh, but there's a, there are some history of science uh, papers that live down here. And these are like 
an outlier, like graphically an outlier. And this should be interesting. Have a look at that. Why don't they? What do they do? How can they contribute to this? In this case, uh, the the Völkerpsychologie. And what do they do? What what is their approach to to history of science? Maybe just like real do like an outlier detection by hand and have a look at it. I think that's maybe another argument to re-enter into close reading again. And if you imagine this would be a huge data set of, I don't know, we can imagine every every psychological, every philosophical paper ever written, we could also do the outlier detection, look at, look at the odd stuff and maybe detect something that's interesting and useful. Cool. <laughs> I, have a, I have a complicated question, but probably for the beer, but a simple <laughs> How the, the authority file is made? Because it seems that you rely on it. Oh, yeah. And how, how the National Library produced that thing? Yeah, uh, so uh, good question, complicated question. Basically, um, there is a thing like uh, there's a German national biography. So, uh, I'm going to get a knot in my brain. And I, don't know. I think you should find the link down here as well as somewhere. Okay. There's a German. Deutsche uh, Biography. It's just Dutch Deutsche Biography. It's a German biography. And um, uh, most of the information is taken from there and just structured in a way into this authority file. But most of it is, is uh, made manually by librarians, basically. Okay, so librarians. Librarians. When yeah. they enter a new book, they look for the author. If it's not there, they add stuff. They add stuff. You can also like uh, the the German National Library has a kind of forms for uh, if if you want to add new people, if like you encounter someone doing your research and you think they should be added, you can submit that, or you could could uh, submit alterations as in okay, we kind of have a duplicate or something like that. Mm -hmm. That might also happen. Um, you can can submit that. But basically, this is uh, uh, by hand uh, by librarians. But there's also the virtual international authority file, which then you can like compare different authority files and kind of get this uh, intercoder <laughs> reliability may maybe uh, compare uh, whether whether the data they indeed agree on the data and then it can be more secure. But then again, I think the German National Library does does a really good job at that, as in having also occupations and stuff like that. But for occupation, there's no time. Timestamp. Yeah, that, that's right. There's no timestamp for there, there is for some people, but for for uh, for them, uh, for for example, Lazarus, it's not that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, but you can like this is the way you could access that uh, uh, via the browser. You can download that as a JSON file and then do stuff and all with that. Your, all your authors were in the. In the authority file? Um, not all of them. I, I actually use the Virtual International Authority okay. file to disambiguate them, and where it's possible, we'll use the GMD, and I think most of them? Everyone, everyone but two, I oh, think, from almost. Like 114 mm -hmm. authors, and only two I can disambiguate with the, with the authority file, I think. Which is fine. Which is, yeah. 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 Oh. Yeah, so I have a question about, uh, so you present some results in this particular journal. Yeah. And I guess there should be some similar studies of other journals, maybe, just to see whether, how, I mean, how surprising the results are. I mean, it's clearly interesting that they have a lot of teachers, but what happens in other German journals? Like, there is no teachers at all, or they have like, I don't know, 20% more teachers? Yeah. So the way to go would compare that with uh, with bibliographic or like bibliometric studies as well. And I'm I'm talking to people. Actually, uh, you said that that Maxime is, is coming and giving a talk. Yes. Right? Yes. So, so so there are people who, who really focus more on on uh, bibliographic and bibliometric studies. And these are people we well I should talk to and I do talk to and compare this finding. And at least um, like I was told, yeah, of course. Um, because journals aren't like the like the way to go are books and monographs, and because journals are already this not so not so cool way of publishing your findings in the 19th century in Germany, there tend to be more people from the fringes 
but still in this journal it's more pronounced and what I think I can stress is just it's like kind of on on their it's it fits to their way a way of thinking of and how to, to publish this uh, not to publish that but how to apply the uh, psychology of peoples in education I think it's just like you, it might prove useful, or might have proven useful to them, and I think therefore it's in and of itself an, an interesting finding that okay, they they reached some educators, which were probably influenced by that because we don't we don't have a way to look into their classrooms, right? So <laughs> then again, this is just 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 a hypothesis. Yeah. Thanks for the question. A follow up question, very short on like precisely this. Um, is the, the journal and the people around it uh, mentioned in the history of education or the history of psychology? Are they relevant for, for that uh, historiography? So in the history of, of psychology, um, um, this journal and Lazo was, especially Lazo was only, not, not Steintan, not the, people, not the person who did the work, but the, the poster child, if you will, uh, is, is mentioned. Lots, of, uh, but mostly as this kind of dead end. As in, yeah, there was this, there was this guy, and he did some stuff, and it's you could see that as a precursor for social psychology or psychology of culture. But it's really like, like I, I think I had, I had a slide on that. It's either okay, they they looked for the soul of a people, something metaphysical, preternatural, not really interesting, or ha, huh, they were so naive back to people. So it's over exaggerated. So in the history of psychology, they are mentioned most of the time. And sometimes it's like they, they had the first idea, and then Wundt, Wundt wrote the real psychology of peoples. So that's even that way. So you get the real Wick history. I said there were some people before, but the good stuff happened then when the guy uh, took the scene. Um, uh, history of education, funnily enough, I think they would also be important for education, um, but they're not really mentioned. But their most important precursor, Herbart, is kind of at least in Germany treated to be like the founding father of of educational studies. Um, so there is a continuity, but like kind of a, an obscure continuity, if you will. Yeah. Okay. What is funny is that each country has its own founding fathers of experimental psychology. Yeah. Because when you said Wundt, I was trained it's William James, of course. Yes. In North America, we learned that William James founded the experimental yeah. psychology. When you move to Belgium, everybody says. We should found it. It's all at the same time. <laughs> so clearly, it's not related to history of science. It's related to countries. Yeah, and, and I mean, <laughs> case, case in point for that theory that we are influenced by our own culture, right? And our perception of the world. Our own hero, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's kind of kind of weird that, that we kind of still have these national narratives of, of science and who who really in, invented <laughs> what, but yeah, I don't know, uh, it's still. I don't know why it's in psychology, <laughs> particularly. Hmm. Well, on that note, <laughs> <laughs>